All right, we are on. Um, go ahead and get your reading questions out. Um, King Arthur later. Get your reading questions for next time. Um, the first thing, huge thing, that Dorothy Mills tells us about, first of all, first, first of all, I guess I've first of all myself twice. Um, this chapter is about the North, Northern Europe. So um, Germany and the Netherlands and England um, that followed a different, kind of a different course of, of the Renaissance. You know, even, I guess we talked about this before, trends travel fast today. Do you know what I mean? If somebody, if something comes in fashion, then it gets posted on the internet and it just is all over, it can be all over the world really, really fast. But if you think about it, if you didn't have internet or movies or pictures or anything, it and people don't travel a lot, the, the majority of people don't travel a lot, it takes a long time for something to for, for a trend to spread. It could take a couple of generations for a trend to spread. Can you imagine if, do you guys know what bell-bottom pants are? Yeah. Okay, so like bell-bottom pants, which were in when I was a little girl. That, that's what I would wear to grade school, bell-bottom pants. That's my age. If they were just now coming in vogue in some parts of the United States, you know, it had taken that long to, to spread, um, that's what it was like in the, in the Renaissance, in the Middle Ages. It took a long time for things to spread. Okay. So in Italy, we, so remember, can you remember what was, what happened in the East that made a big flurry of activity about ancient Greece? So something happened in the East. Oh, oh, what was the dude's name? Was it like Plato's writings got brought over? Yeah. And why did they get brought over? Like, who brought them over? Was it the Constantine dude? No, it was not the Constantine dude. But you're on the right. You're on. You're on the right track. If you change the word Constantine just a little bit, you you're on the right track. Constantinople. Constantinople fell. <laughs> Constantinople, the capital of the East, fell to the Turks, and the people ran away. The people ran away because the Turks were not very nice. They just weren't very nice, and you got out if you could. And so they grabbed what they had, and they brought it with them. And a lot of them, because they had ties with Italy, you know, Venice, remember our friend Venice had been sort of a trading emporium, and so they, they rushed to Italy, and they bring with them all this learning. And I don't know if they could bring artwork with them. I feel like if I'm fleeing an invader, I don't grab statues and load them on the ship. Look, it's not a top priority. I don't know. I don't know. Certainly brought writings that no one in the in the West knew. And they brought the knowledge of the Greek language, which they had never lost. So all of this stuff flooded, but that's Italy. And then it's uh, the French Riviera. They didn't call it the Riviera then, but, you know, um, southern France and Spain. And it takes a while for it to filter up to northern Europe. So we have... Uh, uh, great what we call renaissance painters in the 1300s and around 1400 in italy in the south but now we're up to 1500 in the north you see so it's taken a hundred years to really filter up but one thing that changed everything and this is my first question what did Johann Gutenberg do? Lay it on us, Maya. He invented the printing press. He invented the printing press. Now, as far as we can see, China had already invented printing. So if we wanted to give awards to printing, probably somebody in China should get the actual award. But Gut T. Britain didn't do it. China did. I know. China did everything. And they make great tea. I my dad. Um, <laughs> It seems that way to think of like going to China and they have like those cafes over there with tea and stuff. Oh, yes. Like um, you just remember that it's Britain. British. I don't. And then tea played a huge part in our history because you know they were going to tax the tea. Anyway, um, 
In Europe, the guy who gets credit for it is Johann Gutenberg, who was the first one to do it in Europe, who was the first one to do it on a large scale and really make it a thing. Now, picture, because, see, I have a picture in my mind, but I'm not sure if you guys do. Picture, this means there are metal wood, but metal would be, is better, letters, right, engraved. And have you guys ever seen an, a typewriter? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, and you know the little things that go up, and they mm -hmm. each have a backwards letter on them, right? And you have capitals and small ones, and it, it, you hit the key, and it bumps up, and it hits the paper with ink. So you have these, and they're all loose, and you put them in a case, and, and, and you, you have the, the page that you want to print, and you have to take out all the letters, and you have to actually spell out all the words that are on the page you want to print. And that might seem like, oh my gosh, that would take a really long time. Yeah, but after you do it and you hook it up to the machine, you can print and print and print. You can print thousands of them. Whereas think how long it would take to handwrite thousands of them, mm -hmm. right? So the initial, it might sound really long and drawn out process. When I was a little girl, my mom worked for a while uh, in a Bible bookstore and I would go there after school. And I loved it when somebody wanted a Bible embossed because they had a machine and you would put the letters you know, for their name and you would put it in the embossing machine. I was just fascinated by this. Um, also, do you know the printing press is why we call letters lowercase and uppercase? Because you put the big letters in the Big upper. letters went in the uppercase, and the little letters went in the lowercase. That is why we call them uppercase and lowercase, even though you know, printing now is obviously done digitally. I'm, I'm sure there must be old printing presses of high quality that do this somewhere, but for the most part, you know, the things that get printed out or printed are, are set up digitally. So Gutenberg, um, learned about this, studied it, refined it, and printed a Bible. Sometimes it says 1450 or 1451 or 1453. It's almost like people can't decide what year he did this. Maybe they're not sure. Maybe it took multiple years. Maybe it took multiple years. But he came out with what is known as the Gutenberg Bible. And people were wowed. And people were wowed because, you know, what what makes something expensive? What are, I mean, there's various factors, but what's... Quality makes something expensive. Time. What else? Time makes something expensive. Capitalism. Yeah, capitalism, because you want to make a profit, definitely. Is there anything else? So why why are why is gravel cheap but gold expensive? Because it takes supply. supply. Okay. okay, it takes time and supply. Yeah. And like to mine gold, it's a lot harder. Yes. So you have to go deeper in it. Yes. So anything that's harder to acquire is more expensive. And anything there's less of. We have fewer diamonds than we have gravel. Right? I think this I is probably true. I was talking about this yesterday. Really? Like about why things have value. And so what happens if books are very time consuming because yeah. you have to write them out by hand and so there aren't very many of them because you have to write them out by hand. They're expensive. But when you can just print out, this is me printing. By the way. These are sheets coming out. I don't know why I have to do that every time I talk about printing. Um, books get cheap. And the average person can now afford to have a few books of their own. Nothing like this. I bet mo most medieval people, if they came in this house and saw the number of books, and the number of books that I'm sure are in all of your houses, they would just like keel over. Books just in my room. And that, that would be an astounding library to the people of this time. But um, but with printing, it com it's within your grasp. And so I love this comment that Dorothy Mills makes. I kind of feel this way myself. Um,
The invention of printing in the 15th century made it possible for more books to be available, made books cheaper, and made more people want to read. Men would make all kinds of sacrifices to get the classics, as the Greek and Latin books were called. They would go hungry to save the money for the price of a book or to pay for the teaching that would open this new world to them. When's the last time you went hungry for a book? I think mean, one never. time I didn't eat because I was reading so much. Well, this is true. I can understand that. But we probably, and me included, no one in this room has ever gone without food because you're saving up money for a particular book. Because your parents feed us. Your parents feed you. And also because books have just gotten to the point where they are very, very, even expensive books. Like uh, To me, an expensive book is if I spend more than $40 on a book. Like that's 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 getting a little more up there. But to me, it's like fifteen. Yeah. Um, I don't buy because I spend a lot of you know twenty thirty dollar books. We just go to library. I know. I and and libraries too. Yes. Or a dollar. And that's where I acquire most. But sometimes you can't find it. You need that book. I bought five books yesterday. Um. Anyway, I just thought it was interesting that the hunger to know and to learn was so strong. And maybe because for so many years, people hadn't had the opportunity. I mean, for generations, people hadn't had the opportunity, you know? And so, obviously, more and more people are learning to read. And illiteracy wasn't as much a thing in the Middle Ages as people think. I mean, if you're a peasant, if you're a serf or a peasant working on someone's land, you probably never learned to read. But a lot of people did get the chance to learn. If you if you got put in a monastery, you learned to read. Because you had to read the Bible, and you had to read the, the office, you know, the, the, the divine office to go do the prayers. You had to be able to read. So a lot of people could already read. But I just love that comment. Erasmus, whom we met in this chapter, is quoted as saying, when I have a little money, I buy books. And with what's left over, I buy food and clothes. That was his priority system. I mean, I'm probably me too. If I was living on my own. I would spend, if I did not have my husband to oversee me. <laughs> I, I have to answer to own, somebody though, and so I don't. strained from buying books. Why don't you just go to the library? Because, because the owning sometimes, is not well, so A, great. because sometimes I want them over and over again. Often I mark in my books. You see, I take notes in the in the front, and then I mark things. And but if it's a book that I've gotten from the library and I want to write things down, I just put my my notes in, and then I copy them into my commonplace book. But I use the library regularly. But there's also, some the books that you just want. Of owning a book, incredible. It's like finishing a series. I have almost yes. all the Percy Jacksons. Ownership is. I su highly support ownership of books. Okay, let's go back to Dorothy Mills. Um, <laughs> Another thing that happened that she brings out that you don't really think about, you know, um, picture a world where we don't travel much and so we don't talk to people even 30 miles away very often. So we can't call so them. So Europe. Up. So Europe. <laughs> what, you mean Europe today? Oh. oh so um, they're like, oh, 45 minutes. Yes. <laughs> but picture when you might your entire life not go out of your own village, okay? So you guys know, you can picture, that when you have separated groups of people, you might speak the same language, but you start doing it a little bit differently, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Over generations, you start. So in America, you know, at Midwest versus East Coast mm -hmm. versus Southern, they have different slang words that they use, different phrases that are, that are popular. We all speak the same language. We also have accents going on, mm -hmm. right? And if we stopped, like suddenly the East Coast is frozen and isolated, and the South is isolated, and the Midwest is isolated, in a hundred years, we might have a little more trouble understanding the people from the other places. And this is what happened in Europe, right? So this is what happened to Latin. That's why Italian and Romanian and Spanish, and French, and Portuguese, they're all Latin. Even like different parts of Britain. 
Okay. Even different parts of Britain right now, like a Yorkshire accent, okay. a heavy okay. Yorkshire okay. accent is, and, and the Welsh, don't even get started on the Welsh. Yes, very hard to understand. And this is not a big island. So, so it was maxed out in the Middle Ages, and so we have languages rising and doing their own thing, but we also have a language, you know, pick a language, whether it's French or English or Italian, and people are all doing it a little bit differently, and there's no standard. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, um, in the Middle Ages, even in early America, you see people spelling things however the heck they want to. Because it's no rule. You just you just do it the way your local people do it. Until they put in rules. And then everything and until like they put in rules. rules. And rules come with printing. And like even with the same languages like England and America, the reason America has cancelled out so many letters is because of capitalism. Because when we were printing in the early ages, they would charge by letters. Not what words. letters have we left out? Like in color, we leave out the U, and like oh oh yes, and um, all the O R words are O E U R. Yes, that's very interesting. I didn't know that that it was because of finances. Um, to picture America, okay, and there's and America is medieval now. I realized there was no medieval. I mean, there was a medieval America, but it was Indians. But just play along with me, okay? So picture. The printing press is now in New York City. Just pretend we're still The main going. printing press is New York City. How is, what kind of spelling and language is every book printed in New York City going to have? Local New York I mean. standard, right? And it's going to spread across the country. And so this is what happened. Dorothy Mills says, let's see how she puts it. Um, the English of the time had been going through a period of transition and it needed more stability. Without taking away from its vitality or its adaptability, the printed form tended to bring order out of the changing conditions and to hand down a language that was to grow into the magnificent English of the 16th century. It standardized things. Yes, at rule, yeah, AKA rule. But they can be helpful when you're dealing with people from other areas. Do you know what I mean if you have some common, I mean, we know that if, you, if your language is completely not in common, you can't communicate at all. And when there are obstacles, it makes it harder. Like also, a baby. what? Yes. And, well, I'm going to stop there. Um, don't know what to say about that. Um, okay, I asked you next, what is humanism? Natalie? The study of humanities, like thoughts, emotions, um, char characteristics, deeds, life. Just like yeah. the study of humans. Yes, exactly. Anybody want to add to that? Or did she cover it well? Um, let's see if she has a definition in here. I, I wrote down the definition. Oh, read it to us because I can't the find it. The studies of man's thoughts and philosophy of life, his standards of conduct, his deeds, his difficulties, his triumphs, his love of beauty, and the expression he gave to it. Nice. Um, what what's different? What what was the main focus of interest in the Middle Ages? What were they studying? Philosophy. Philosophy, and what did that mean for them? What was the highest philosophy? Bible. Bible. God. Theology. Theology. In the Middle Ages, we want to know about God. And in the Renaissance, we want to know about man. Now, I have to I have to interject something here. There is, because humanism is, modern humanism is not the same thing as what these people meant by it, okay? Modern humanism, when you see anybody's described as a humanist, especially if a Christian is describing someone else as a humanist, it means they don't believe in God. That's an atheist. I know, but, but it, it means, <clears throat> It means that their study of mankind, their study of the world is limited and assuming that nothing affects it from outside. Man is all there is. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. So yes, atheism means you don't believe in God. But these people, um, so, when we, so we often call them secular humanists. Secular means of the world. 
All right. But humanism, in this case, as you read Thomas More and Erasmus, these guys loved the Lord. All right. But they were very interested in man. What do people think? How do people relate to each other? How do people relate to God? That's kind of psychology. It is a form of psychology. And they were interested in also what people produce. That goes along with all this literature pouring into Europe, right? What, what had people written? So they wanted to look at, at Plato. They wanted to look at the Greek uh, writers of, of plays and find out how they explored what happens to people and how they react to it. This was meant by humanism. So <clears throat> it's not the same. If you hear people, like I said, in modern terms, that humanist perspective, it tends to imply they believe man is all there is. These people did not believe man was all there is. But they thought man deserved a good look. And they thought that people were capable of producing beautiful, wonderful, true things. And I agree with them in that. Uh, so I already mentioned Erasmus, our first humanist. Um, what book published by Erasmus greatly furthered the study of the Bible? I couldn't find one. Okay. Is it the following? Or uh, 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 no. Oh, like good. Okay. okay. All right. Let me let me read this. Is it like the Chronicle thing? Yeah. Was it like that? I thought in, that was a series. In 1516, he published his edition of the New Testament in Greek. This was the original Greek with a Latin translation. Erasmus believed in the importance of going back to the original, and he advocated the translation of the Bible into the vernacular. Vernacular means the language, the local language, from the original and not from translations. He regarded the books of the Bible as a great literature which should be widely known and read. Okay, so actually, that was a trick question because you had to read between the lines with that and figure out what would the reformers really like. They would like to have a Greek New Testament to, to use for study. However, Natalie mentioned in Praise of Folly. Praise of Folly is really fun. Um, my high school students right now are writing one of these. It's called an encomium, and they have to praise something, a person or a place or a thing. And it was a set style. Like you just picked a thing and you praised it. Well, he decided to praise folly, foolishness. But it was a satire. He's fake praising it. And he's bringing out all the foolish things that people do. As if he's praising it, but it's obvious that it's stupid things that they're doing. And a large part of it is devoted to the church. The foolishness of the medieval stuff that had accrued on the church. And uh, particularly the people who weren't living out their vocations. All right. It wasn't so much the teachings of the church as the people. Does that make sense? The people who were money-grubbing bishops who were pressing the people for, for, for contributions, quote-unquote. Um, monks, like we met in the Canterbury Tales, uh, in the Chaucer storybook, the, the monk who would rather be out hunting and hawking and drinking ale than serving the poor or being with the lepers or, or praying. No, that would be boring. We'd rather do something else. Erasmus really sticks it to him in the praise of folly. So that also had, a, had an impact on the reformers, um, definitely. Erasmus, did you get the impression the guy just lived everywhere and did everything? As you read about his life, just he kept, now we live here. Now we live in England. Now we live in Italy. Now we live in France. Now we live in the Netherlands. He was dedicated to a monastery, apparently at a young age, and he just wasn't suited. It just wasn't his vocation. Other people had decided to put him there. And But he really, really, really loved to study all day and talk to other people who liked to do that too. So he got permission to, to leave and then spent his life learning and teaching and writing. Um, he is very 
contradicting to me. Hmm. Like he wrote. He wrote the praise of, uh, praise of folly, right? Is that what's going on? Mm-hmm. Yes. And it said, um, like, I did, I went back over the whole page and stuff where it's just so contradicting because it, it said it was the most mercilessly critical thing of the church mm-hmm. in the time. Mm-hmm. And then he refused to, to stand with the Reformation okay. because they were too violent. Okay. But so, he didn't do anything. He and that, that was that was the next question, right? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish. So, he, he was, um, he believed what the, what the reformers were teaching, right? Like, it said that he agreed with them. Up to a point. Does anybody want to? Well, 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 Oh, no, no. Let Addison finish. Okay, I'm sorry. So, he agreed with, with what they were saying and calling for in the church, but he didn't agree with how they went about it, and he said he thinks that it should be done more moderately. But then he didn't do anything about it. So he, he, this is the problem. Like people call for change, mm. and then they say, "You well, you're doing it wrong," and then they don't do anything about mm. it. And that's what I, what I saw, and uh, what, I, what I thought when I read this about him. That's very insightful. No, you wanna, you wanna respond? Well, the thing is, if you're gonna join a movement, you want it to change. Like if, say, you, you were to join the feminist movement and you thought they were being too aggressive or too hateful towards men and you wanted them to change, are you going to go and change that? Are you going to go like, stop this or I'll join, and then I'll join you? No, you're just going to sit. You're not going to do anything about it, are you? I mean, why not? Yeah, because you're one person, you can't change a whole Mm. movement. Mm. Well, that doesn't mean you, you just do nothing. You can't. I mean, like, if you're... Just because you're one person doesn't Luther, mean you can't try. Luther was one person, yeah, just and he gathered people around him. It's Luther changed yeah. the world. It's definitely tough to church. do it because you're one person, but it doesn't mean you should. Yeah, but he had Honestly, though, they already had the same mindset as him. They already thought, yes, this but is... But honestly, against them. If, you're, if you're one person, and you have a certain, like, oh, I don't like this about... there. There's a lot of people in the world... There's probably gonna be someone but out they there could, that has the same that, that, everyone, that yeah. agrees with you that you can but be like help the Middle me. Ages everyone's where they gonna have, like travel across the entire everyone world. Okay, but even just people. in the same town. Yeah. Okay, Andrew wants to say everyone something. Has, everyone's gonna have an opinion, but then there's only gonna be certain people that are are gonna go out and do something just because of how they how they are. Well, because. And there's some people just don't do and that. And plus, how would you change so their minds? Just talking to them, you think that would change? He doesn't have to. Well, you gotta start somewhere. I mean, yeah, he doesn't have to. Um, he doesn't have to join the Reformation. He can do other things in the church without. Like he has a like a high. People think highly of him. He has influence. Mm. It said all the things that he was like asked to do, like chancellor, he, and I think in the council of the king or something. He had influence. He could have done stuff. It wasn't like he was just a peasant from nowhere. You know, he had power over people. I want to just bring it, I want to go back to Andrew for a minute, just because he sounds, I'm not an Erasmus scholar by any means, okay, but he sounds, from what's presented in this book, like someone who is relatively quiet and studious, and not, and do you know how some people are just naturally charismatic and can go out there and do it, and some people have a natural bent to just... Not. Do you, you know what I mean? Um, introverts and extroverts. Exactly. We don't take that into as much account as we should. Um, so I think Andrew may have a point. I think all you ladies have a point. That that I think Natalie has a point that it's very hard. It takes a lot of gumption to stand up against a whole movement and say we need to reform the reforming. But I also see Addison's point that if you... Um, agree in theory with a group of people that and you are well respected that being a part of that group presumably you can have um pull. A, a pull some 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 effect some ability to to persuade and tone things down you want to say something else go ahead so he um like when we say he was just sitting on the sidelines doing nothing he wasn't doing that he he wrote praise of folly and he, um, when I read this, I imagined him, like, in a crowd, 
and there are a bunch of people around him shouting for like reform and stuff. And then he said something that really like got people's attention. And then when they turned to him and like confronted him, he just backed down and he said, "I am not taking a side." Mm -hmm. So he spoke out against the church, and then he, but then he refused to like act on it. You know, well. If he is against the movement, he's not going to join. Like he, he's not against the movement. Well, he's against how well, violent but, they are. yeah, but that's what the movement is. They are a violent movement, and if he's against that, he's not going to join. Okay, so I'm going to interject with some more information that Dorothy Mills doesn't give you. Okay, to make it clear, so <clears throat> Erasmus did not completely agree with the Reformation. The Reformation ended up, and not very far into into like during Luther's lifetime. They ended up completely changing what the worship of God was and looked like and had looked like for 1,500 years. Now, I, we have Catholics and Protestants in this room. I am not selling a particular brand, okay? I just want to make that perfectly clear because it's not fair. That's not what I'm here to do, okay? But I just want to, to this is just the truth. This is just the facts. So up until Luther, from the very beginning of the church, as far as we could see, the church, the service of the church centered on taking communion. That's why you went. That's the point. The talking, the singing, secondary. You go because they have the body and blood of the Lord. That's the main event. And Luther and, the, and that reforming movement changed that. Okay, and so Erasmus wasn't on board with that. Why did he want to change that it was communion? <sighs> I always thought it was, I he wanted to get the Bible to more people. That's mm. what I always realized. Well, I mean, he did, but he wanted to get his. I can't, I can't, I can't say this without sounding like I'm anti. He wanted to get his own version of it to the people. And, you know what, pastors. When you preach, when that's the centerpiece of a service, it's a lot of clout. Do you know what I mean? A pastor can have a lot of power in his sermons. Um, but in Catholic and Orthodox tradition, the, the sermon is not really, it's like a, you know, it can be mediocre, right? But that's not why you're there. You're, you're there to take communion. Like, I just want, I want that. I'm here for that. And yes, please tell me about the, the Bible verses that we read, but I want that. And, um, and maybe it was because Luther had a, a you know, it gave Luther a, 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 a podium at which to speak. Um, also, Luther started questioning the basic tenet of why we want communion. And that is the fact that it mystically, supernaturally becomes the body and blood of the Lord. That is a Catholic and Orthodox teaching that Protestants have a lot of time. And we're not going to go, like, this isn't a theology class, so I can't do that. But he did not, he believed in um, consubstantiation, okay, so it, the, the body was there alongside of it. But then the reforming movement took off, and then we have people like Zwingli and Calvin saying, yeah, it's just a memorial service. There's nothing, there's nothing mystical about that stuff, all right? Now, I don't, you talk to your parents about how your tradition feels about that, right? That's not, but this is what happened. And so Erasmus was a traditionalist. He's like, no, I still go to take the body and blood of our Lord, and the, the, the mass, the service, should not be tinkered with. But he still believed that there were abuses in the church and problems with the church. So picture this. There's two ways to fix something, right? One thing is you come from outside and you smash it, and you build a new one. The other is you stay inside it and you guide change from within and you say, is this a good idea? Is that a good idea? And Martin Luther also probably turned Erasmus off. I think Dorothy Mills mentioned. Martin Luther was very crude and crass in his language. He was very insulting. He just was. He was a big man and a blustering man and a very large personality, you know, one of these people. And Erasmus was more refined and gentle. And so they actually wrote books back and forth to each other. Um, and one thing that they argued about, that they didn't couldn't agree on also, was um, whether or not the will of man is free. 
whether or not man has free will. And um, Erasmus wrote a book called The Freedom of the Will, and Luther wrote back a book called The Bondage of the Will, and argued with each other. And you can read, and you can read, and they're arguing with each other. So there were actual theological points on which they just couldn't agree. Does, does that make sense? So they're, so they're, okay, so they're both on the same side saying there are abuses in the church and we need to do something about them. But they were on opposite sides of theology. And I think that Erasmus thought, you know, when you pour your energy, he could be out there talking and, and, and networking and, and helping the movement, but he spent his, you know, his mental and emotional energy in preparing that Greek New Testament, thinking that, okay, when the officials of the church have access to what it actually says in the original, things will change. All right, so I am not, you all make really good points. There was just more information that we weren't privy to. Go ahead now. So like, kind of, I, I said this earlier, like, well, I didn't really say this, but like, if he didn't agree with the um, with the movement, he didn't have to just be in the movement. He could have, like you said, guided from inside the church. Like he didn't. It's not like the church mm -hmm. is great. And there's nothing wrong with it. Versus the church has to go. That's not the only two. It's not white and black. Mm -hmm. You know, there yes. can be ways that he could have worked that, and he just didn't. I think that he thinks he did by preparing a a, a Greek Bible that people could use for study he, to guide them back to what he thought were the more fundamental truths. From what I've read, like in other books and stuff, he was like more of a recluse and... He lived everywhere. Yeah, but, like, yeah, but that doesn't mean you like to schmooze with people. Just because you live everywhere doesn't mean you're gonna hang out with people every day. I mean, I'm an introvert and I think that writing like a paper and like making sure all of my points are correct is better than just going up on a podium, giving the speech, and then just like, people can't always remember the speech, but they can always have that paper. And he, he thought writing that book would change people's minds forever. Cause like, it would change their actual like thought process. Instead of just like one speech. You all bring, thank you. You all bring up really good points. I enjoy our discussions here. Um, it is very hard to know what one would do if one were in a similar situation. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I've mentioned, my husband and I watched Survivor, and uh, you know, it's very easy to sit there when I'm on the couch with my popcorn and say, that's a stupid thing to do, don't do that. But if I were there and I hadn't slept in two weeks and I was living on rice, there's no telling what I might do out there. I might do the stupidest things imaginable because I'm lonely and I'm tired and I'm hungry and, you know, it's hard to say. But I, I believe, Addison, that he thought he was a mover for the better in his study. Um, and, and yeah, and I think... Luther, Luther's blustering turned him off a bit, definitely, but I think they also had some theological issues that he just felt like he couldn't throw in his, his lot with them. Um, but it's, it, it's interesting, even, you know, and this is not known real well as far as the Reformation goes, there was a movement within the church, it was called the oh, something of divine love. It was based in Rome, and they were a group of reformers within the Catholic Church. At the same time, it, it is quite possible, in other words, that if there had been no Luther, there still would have been change in the church because there was already a movement afoot within the church. So Erasmus probably knew about this movement as well. It's like we can change it from by leaving it and starting our own, or we can change it from within. And I, I guess if we got in a time machine and went back and we were plopped there, we'd find out what each of us would I'd join Luther. do. Was Luther actually violent? He, well, there was violence associated with it. He was not violent, but there was a, he was preaching um, equality of people. And, uh, and some of the people hearing him took it a little more um, literally than he meant. And there was a huge peasants revolt in Germany and people were murdered. And, and, and Luther actually called for the, the king at the time to put it down. 
Like you, you need to go out with the, with the swords and put it down. You need to stop these people. They can't just run riot like that. So there were outbreaks of violence, yes. Um, but Luther never called for that. Luther never called for that, no. We will, we will revisit, we will be reading more about the progress of the rift. So this is sort of like part one, but hold on to all these thoughts. Don't forget this discussion today, because maybe as we read, then more things will come to light and we might, um, it might solidify your position if you have, or it might change how you feel about it as we read on. Um, last question I asked you was about Thomas More. Uh, we met him last week, actually. Who is Thomas More and what happened to him? He was a man of the Renaissance, and he was executed. He was a man of the Renaissance, and he was executed. Yeah. He was um, the successor to Wolsey as like cardinal, and, like counselor to the king. He was a member of parliament, and yeah, he was executed on account of treason because they didn't like his ideals. Yes. Um. You know what? Can I? I'm sorry. I did this very poorly, but I just I had a flag here, and it was about Erasmus, and. It, it is sometimes forgotten that it takes a good deal of courage to do the unpopular thing. In the passions which the religious controversies of the 16th century aroused, when it was unpopular to refuse to take sides, Erasmus stood as firmly for his convictions as did Luther. He was in no way fitted to be the leader of a reformation that required vigorous action, an inspiring and heroic example. But it has been said of Erasmus, that a new reformation in men's thoughts and ideals may be able to look back to him for its inspiration. I just I marked that because I just thought it takes a lot of courage to do the unpopular thing when everybody's clamoring. Because people were feeling like you were our Addison. Like, get out there and do something. But why are you just sitting there and letting this happen? Why aren't you why, why? Well, because I don't completely agree with you and I think my way is better. I think my way is gonna bear fruit. Okay, I'm sorry, back to Thomas More. Thomas More was the chancellor, like Natalie said, after Wolsey. Um, <clears throat> when Wolsey couldn't get Henry his divorce and he fell out of favor, Thomas More got the job. But uh, as he couldn't, still couldn't get the divorce. And when Henry decided to make his own church, when he decided, I'm just going to have my own church and I'm going to be the head of the church. He said that everybody would have to swear an oath to the church. An Thomas oath More refused. to his, to him as the leader of the church. And Thomas More said, "Yeah, I can't do that. I can't do that. You're Does not, the, you're not the church? leader of the church. Does you're, he makes his own church. you're, you're not, you are not the leader of the church. The Pope has been given responsibility to be the leader of the church, not you. And I won't do it. And they cut his head off for it." Thomas More is the guy who wrote the uh, the thing about uh, the sheep enclosures. We, we read an excerpt from Utopia. He wrote this uh, really sort of pretty entertaining, not very long book about a, an island uh, a, a, where no one had visited and, and some traveler got you know shipwrecked there and found out about their their uh, pol politics and customs and everything and set it up as um, as the ideal state. And it was in, he was a friend of Erasmus. So it was his dig at modern politics and, and the modern world. Okay, yeah, Addison. Um, was he the one that didn't think war was unbiblical? Possibly. I can't remember if it said that or not. It did say I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised. Excerpt. See if we can find it. This is about his life. Oh, no, that was... Um, Erasmus. Of Erasmus, okay. Um, so that's something that I underlined. It said, but men should not need to be told that war is of necess necessity unjustifiable. Hmm. Which, uh, I mean, like, earlier it said that he was like timid too. Like, his nature was timid. I don't know, I so mean. So does that explain a little bit, you yeah. know, maybe his actions? Even, and you know, here's the thing about people in the past. We, we don't have to agree with what they did. And I think there's no point in studying history if we don't want to critique, you know, the, 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 the outcome and the morals of people and their reasons. 
but at the very least to try to understand why they might have done it. I feel like we, we owe them that. We don't have to agree with what they did, but maybe we can just try to understand why. And I feel like maybe we could understand why, given a certain personality and given the, the very, very large personality he was trying to work with, which is Luther. Um, and it, we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to that. Um, I brought some artwork. Durer and Holbein were mentioned, uh, two German artists. And you, we met Holbein last week. Um, he's the guy who did that portrait of Henry VIII. Oh, he did a, the, the one, you know, remember? Oh, yeah. uh, he wrote, he did a lot of portraits, Holbein. There's two Holbeins. There's two Hans Holbeins, the elder and the younger, but it's apparently the younger that did most of the, the work that we look at. I, I brought, I brought another Holbein that, this is the thing you're going to love. Oh, oh I'm going to be so disappointed if you don't love it. But first I'm going to show you Durer. Durer, absolutely gorgeous. All right, did, okay, woodcuts. Do you know what a woodcut is? Like carving. Or like, like carving. Is it like, would it, you have those big panels and it's like carved inside of it? Or is it like a statue? No, do neither. You, do you take one of those uh, hot melting, whatever whatever it is, that, uh, no, 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 no. It's wood burning. Yeah, yeah, it's it. Except they don't burn it, but they chisel it. So oh, you, yeah. have a, you have a block of wood and you chisel out the opposite of what you want and then you print it. You see, that's a woodcut. So you've got to you've got to cut out the parts you don't want to appear. So it's like a stamp. It's like a stamp. Only this guy did stamps that are just out of this world detailed. Like, amazing. Did he like I mass produce them? Um limited produced. Sometimes only only one, but sometimes woodcuts would be um, a, a, like a, a limited series. But what he often did and to mass produce is he did illustrations for books. So the the front, you know, you picture an old beautiful book, and you and the front page has this gorgeous picture on it. You know, not the cover, but you know, inside he would illustrate um, books that were being printed with his woodcuts. And they are out of this world gorgeous. But I brought um, some of his watercolors. Um, this, uh, I know, I know. He did, he did nature, love nature. This Still is my, watercolor? This is watercolor. Wow. Wow. If you love this, you're going to love the like other that side. Size? How do you even do that? I do, not, I do not know how large it actually is. That's a really That's good crazy. question. But look at the next one. Oh my gosh. Oh, no. it's a hair. I think it's a hair because it's bigger. I do not know. I just know it's gorgeous. It's and I know it is extremely bunny. detailed. Oh my gosh, look at all the little fur. I would not be able to Did you bring one of his uh, hand dog I don't know. You know what? Um if you guys want, if we get done early enough, I'll shut the computer off and then oh shoot, I don't know their password. <gasps> I do. I think I have it on my phone. I think I know their Wi-Fi password. Anyway, well, or I can find it on my phone, but it would be nicer to find it this. Maybe I could see some, find some pictures of the woodcuts. Mm -hmm. Remind me, like at, at five, five minutes till being done, say, shut it off and show us a woodcut. <laughs> if you don't, you have to be my memory because my mind is starting to go. Um, okay, and then this is a pencil, pencil drawing. Oh, this is a very famous one. Yeah. It's Durer, the praying hand. And it is just stunning. Now, I looked this up online, and apparently, um, I don't know if it's just this this reproduction of it, but it's actually blue. And it was something where it's it's like a blue paper, and he used white. Instead of doing the dark, it's the light that he drew in. Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? And so the places that are dark were where he left it more. And the places that are light are where he shaded it light. It's like if you got black paper or dark construction paper, you know, in a light colored pencil, and you tried to make a picture like that. Amazing. Durer is fabulous. And often, do you notice the signature at the bottom? A.D. Albrecht Durer, That's 1502. <laughs> that was his signature. It doesn't appear in the other ones, but 
all kind of juice. So love him. If you're into nature and realism, and realism Durer is your guy. Love okay. Realism. Um, just like realistic painting. Yeah. Like there's abstract Not impressionism realism. or something like that. Okay. So let's hold on. Did I figure out which one I want to show you first? Okay. I want to show you this one first. Did this picture called The Ambassadors. I'm going to pass it around because I want everybody to look. Oh, look, I know that picture. You know this picture? Okay. So if you know, if you know what this is, don't say. I don't want anyone to say if you think you know what this is. Actually, I just, I want to pass it around. And um, we don't know, first of all, let's talk oh, about what we don't know. We don't know who these guys are. We, we, we don't know what the purpose of this painting is. We know that they're surrounded by um, musical things, scientific instruments, and ge geographical things. Wow. You see the globe. And this is really kind of all we know. And they just call it the ambassadors. Okay, everybody, just that. take a look. But if you figure out what that thing is at the bottom, that kind of smudge, don't say. Do you know what it is? I do know what it is. I know what it is. I've seen this picture before. I, think I, I love his artwork. Okay. It's so detailed. Yeah. It's insane. Like, you can see the words on the globe if you look. Oh, closely. yeah. No. It's, like these the guys were realism like, to the max. And like, like the dagger photographs. the hand is so detailed. It's so cool. <laughs> I know what you do. So cool. That's very other cool. Work too. It's so detailed. Yeah. Well, you know what? It, it, it we'll look up somewhere. Holbein. Um, if you if you Google Durer or Holbein and you just go to images, <clears throat> it just brings up tons of their artwork. If you want to see more of it, but we'll look up some wood. Oh gosh, that's so weird. It's that's Okay, so it appears that that most of you have figured out what it is. Yeah. Tell tell me, say it. Skull. A skull. A skull. Why would there be a skull okay. there? Because because we can. Because we can. Now, if lot, here here's the what this. There were other paintings like this. A lot of times, um, Renaissance painters just put skulls there to fill in the space. Yes, it was or okay. So skulls often appeared in things as a memento mori which means, um, uh, roughly translated, remember, you will die. Wow. A remembrance of death. Cool. <laughs> and, and I, forgot, I forgot about that one. And it's, a tip, it's, <laughs> it's an <laughs> exhortation to remember that all the stuff that you think is important and your wealth and your status, you're going to die. Don't get so hung up on it. So this is a healthy thing. Wow. Like remembering that you're mortal is is a healthy. I think we could all agree. You don't want to obsess over over it, but um, so they would often put skulls and things, trappings of death, as a reminder. But so like this was creepy little demon in that last. Oh, um, but Bosch, oh, Hieronymus so Bosch. Weird. Oh yeah. Um, the so they would make paintings with optical illusions in them for kicks. And so I saw you guys doing this. What they would do, and it, it's speculated that this painting may have been hanging um, uh, by a staircase. So you're going up the stairs. And there was often a place in the frame for you to put your eyes so that you can see it that way. Because as, as, you, as I saw some of you doing, if you look at it from the side, you start to see. And this is, this is it from the side. Oh. You know, if you had a perfect view, this is what you see. All right, which is crazy detailed and cool squished, it. which is just crazy. But but so imagine if this was at your house, you know, and every time you walk up the stairs, you yeah, glance yeah, and you can see that skull. But you can only see it if you're right here. And so he had to paint it like that, or from the sides if you turn. How it do you do that? That's crazy. Yeah. That is crazy. I love it did though. Did he do a lot like that? I don't know that he did any others like that. I know other people so thing dry, like did that sort of it, thing. But another to do it like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, perspective is hard. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Holbein, the ambassadors. This this is the most famous example of one of these brain twisting 
I uh, optical illusions. Uh, let me give you your uh, reading in Dorothy Mills for next week. Um, we are skipping chapter eight. This is, is not a mistake. Again? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to think I'm prejudiced against France. No, it's Renaissance education. It's all about schools and the Renaissance. And if you want to know about Renaissance education, you just go for it. You read it and have fun. But I, unfortunately, it would just be a heavy, heavy reading load for you guys to read every single chapter in this book in a semester. Do you know what I mean? It would be too much to talk about. So I, something had to go. It's Renaissance education. So send it around both ways. And let's talk about King Arthur. And let's also talk about your next paper. Oh, boy. <laughs> I sense sarcasm in you. <laughs> no. I didn't surely have to, not. <laughs> I haven't been happy with my papers lately. No, it's okay. okay. Well, then that's good. Then practice is good. I'm just not a right? fan of writing five characters. No, it's really good. Um, I can't even remember what all we're writing about for the rest of the year. I know we're not doing this for the rest of the year. So don't, don't, like, oh my gosh, she's just going to make us do this one after another. I wanted to, to try different kinds of writing um, this year, and I feel like we've accomplished that. But, however, the next assignment is going to be another literary analysis. Uh, all right? I want you to do one more of these for me. I'm going to give you two weeks. What's it about? You are going to choose a story from the King Arthur. Oh, yes. no. Oh, See? On. See, you can't. I can't please everybody. There's so See, many, no matter what I do, so somebody's going to say. Any of it. You like Why it. Why do they? Well, it's your turn the to like something. something. That's a great one. Oh, that um, one. It does yeah. not have to be one that you read this past week, because we are obviously going to keep reading. So you could, if, if you read one over this next week, you're like, oh, I like, I really like that one. I really want to look at that one. Um, you have the same options. Would one of you pull out for me that paper I gave you last week? That that literary analysis, you know, with the... I don't the, have it. It's in my... I, I okay. pulled this out because it was big in my... No, wait, okay, I got it. He's got it. He's close to me. Okay, so what I want you to do, I'm going to expand your possibilities, okay? Oh, we are going to do the same. Yeah, I totally out. forgot to look at the questions in the back. Well, and you came up with that much, even though you didn't look at the questions. You just had a lot to say. Um, so remember, we are going to start with an introduction. I'm, you can copy this if you want to, but nothing new is going to be written here that you haven't already copied down off the page. Okay. And in our introduction, of course, we uh, catch attention. We, um, backstory. And remember, in this case, we don't need the backstory of the particular story that you're, you're we need just the backstory of King Arthur in general. King Arthur was a possibly mythical, possibly real uh, king of England, you know, fighting the Saxons, and there are many stories told about him. Okay, that's the backstory that we need, right? So that the story that you've chosen makes sense. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, uh, mention your three topics. So if your topics, oh, actually, yeah, one of your topics is going to be which story? So if you pick the story of Balin and Balin, I call them Balin and Balin just because I don't know how else to pronounce their names so that we can tell the difference. You know, the two brothers who ended up killing each other and a bunch of shenanigans in their lives um, and wounding the guy with the, you know, the dolorous stroke with the spear and all this stuff. By which story um, do you mean just sort of like, just tell the story? Well, or? I mean, if you're choosing Balin and Balin, you know what I mean, that story. You might say, one of these um, stories was about two brothers named Balin and Balin. Don't tell me the whole story. Just just mention mention it. Or, here, I gotta look. Um, are we doing all the dress-ups? Yeah, yeah, but just a second. 
let me address Marianas. Or if, um, you know, we want to tell the story of how uh, Morgana Le Fay uh, lured them onto that boat. Do you know? Right? And, and, and magic them the way she does. We might mention, um, in one of the stories we meet Morgana Le Fay, who leads astray, you know, King Arthur and two other knights. Just, just mention the story. Or you can call it by the title that it gives it in the book. In the story, The First Quest of the Round Table, all right, then you've told me which story. Oh. And then, go ahead. Um, so then, like, are we just mentioning that, like, in the introduction, or are we supposed to try to make that into, like, a whole paragraph? No, you're just mentioning it in the introduction. Oh, okay. Because you're going to make it into a paragraph in a minute. Okay? And then tell me your other two things you're going to talk about. All right? If you're going to choose two characters, mention the names of the two characters. Now, obviously, if you're doing the story of Balin and Balin, and you're talking about the two characters, Balin and you're about, then you only need to mention one thing here. In the brothers. story of Balin and Balin, we meet two brothers who have some weird adventures. There, you've, you've told me what you're going to talk about. But if you're going to choose to talk about the, the theme or something else, you need to mention that. Now, I want to stop. Is what I'm saying making sense? Yes. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Then the second paragraph is going to be a summary of the story. Now, this is going to test you. Because these stories are very long and convoluted, are they not? Like a bunch of crazy stuff happened. And I want you to see if you can do it in six sentences or less. This I won't be able like to. The Joffrey story book was easy to do that in, but Okay, this? and I just want to say. I didn't even do it in six let, sentences. Can I, can I say something? The section that you're about, the, 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 the stories you're about to read are probably going to be easier to do than the ones you've already read. So, <clears throat> I'm not saying you can't do Morgana Le Fay magicking them on the on the boat. <laughs> I, you can do Bail and Bound, but the ones you're about to read are gonna be easier. And also, it occurs to me that as you're reading, you could have a piece of paper next to you and jot down notes. Like, you could jot down the important things that happen, and then you'd have your summary sort of put together. You could jot down, you know, interesting things about the character. Or you, if you've got flags or something, paper clips, whatever, bookmarks, you could mark places that you might want to talk about. It might be easier to do it as you're reading than it is to go back after. Does that make sense? Yes. Five paragraphs, right? Yes, yes. So, the, so you're going to summarize the story. And then you're going to have... Uh, two, um, two of these. You may do a character. You may do two characters. You may do a character and the message or the theme. Good luck finding a message or a theme in these stories. <laughs> well, uh, that's not true. Sometimes it's, well, like, like when he chopped off the lady's head. And the message was, don't chop off ladies' heads. No, that was not the message. The message was, you might remember, she flung herself in front of her lord, who had already begged mercy. And because he wasn't giving mercy, he swung around and she flung herself in and he couldn't stop. And now he's always got to live with the fact that he chopped that lady's head off. That's not but fair. he's got to live with the fact that he didn't show mercy. How did Does he that make sense? Chop both heads off. If she like flung herself in front of him, they were still both there. They Head is pretty hard to chop both off if you're only trying to do.